Hi, welcome again to the show. I'm Leslie Choice, and my guest today is Silver Donald Cameron, the author of several books, including Sailing Away from Winter. We're going to talk to him about that one today. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be back. Now, sailing seems to me to be one of those wonderful addictions that people get hooked on. When did you start sailing in your life? I was going to say like surfing, right? Yeah, uh, for sure. I didn't start until I was over 30. Um, I, I, I guess somewhere way back in the back of my mind, probably going back to when I read the Ransom, Arthur Ransom's wonderful children's books in uh, elementary school, probably somewhere in the back of my mind was the notion that this was something I would do sooner or later. Um, but the opportunity didn't arise and didn't arise, and then, uh, and then I was actually looking for a house in Nova Scotia, and I found myself rejecting beautiful houses that weren't on the coast, and, uh, and, and beautiful houses that were on the coast if they weren't on the harbor. And I suddenly thought, what's going on here? And, and realized that I was looking for a place where I could have a boat. And uh, it hadn't even been conscious. I just found myself rejecting places where I couldn't do that. So you ended up in Discoos? Um, in Discoos in Cape Breton, Cape yeah. Cape Breton, beautiful, yeah. beautiful place. Uh, and that's where the story of this journey begins. Maybe you could tell me how it started to come together. Well, I, you know, you could take this starting point to be any one of a number of, uh, of places, I guess. But I guess the real thing was when my uh, publisher, Doug Gibson, called me up and said, you know, what are you going to write for me? And, and I said, I've got nothing for you. I want to do something else quite different. And, and he sort of pressed me. And, uh, and finally, I conceded that in the back of my mind, I'd always had another one of these notions that I hadn't really brought too firmly to consciousness, that, which was that I wanted to go down the East Coast and, uh, and spend a winter down south and so on. And he immediately said, sailing away from winter, what a wonderful concept. Who's publishing this book? And I said, Doug, it's not a book. It's just an idea. It's, it's not even an idea. Oh, no, no, no. You want, you're going to do the book. Uh, I'm going to publish it. Uh, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. And after two or three attempts, he actually did. And uh, so we, then the next problem, of course, was that my wife said our boat was too small. So we wound up getting another boat and, uh, and, and uh, then working on that for two full winters before we actually left. Wow. So how exactly did you prepare for this journey? Well, uh, we'd obviously done a lot of, of sort of preparing for the trip in the sense of reading and, and you know, talking to people who'd done it and, and all that sort of thing. But I also sort of looked at the boat and said, well, what, does, what would we need to be comfortable on this boat for, you know, what, what amounts to about a year? Um, and what do we need to be safe? Uh, so we added, you know, radios and radars and GPSs and all that kind of thing and modified a lot of the interior to, uh, just to make it suit us a little bit better. And took, you know, we took months and months and months to do it. Fun. I mean, I enjoy doing that kind of thing, but uh, it was quite time consuming. And it is, it's, a, it's a different creature altogether sailing today as opposed to sailing 100 years ago, isn't it, because of the technology? Well, it absolutely is. I, I read one of the books, uh, uh, was, what was it, Me, the Boy, and the Cat. Um, which is an account of the same trip taken about a hundred years ago, maybe a little over. And uh, uh, this was a fellow who went down the whole intercoastal waterway as we did. Uh, he had no engine, of course, and uh, he was towing, a, uh, he was in about a 20-foot boat, and he was towing a dory, and when he got into difficulties, he would get out in the dory, and he would row and tow the, the boat going on down. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like the hard way. Yeah, yeah, it was very much harder than, than what it is today. But also, there's, there's stuff like the, uh, the GPS and the, and the radar, um, you know, people just don't get into trouble the way that they used to. There, there used to be a big, big salvage uh, industry on the east coast of Canada, and it's totally gone because nobody wrecks ships anymore. And with the weather predictions, you're getting that on a very regular basis. Did you find that totally reliable? Uh, no. Oh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, no. No, and perhaps most spectacularly, we were trying to avoid Hurricane Jean. And she was supposed to be going out, uh, yeah, as, as she came up the coast, she was supposed to be going out somewhere uh, more or less offshore towards Nantucket. So we thought, well, okay, we'll head inland up Narragansett Bay and into Rhode Island and into a little place called Wickford, which should be well away from the storm track. Well, the storm veered and came straight over Wickford, as it turned out. And if we'd gone out to Block Island, which was the alternative, we would have been much more comfortable. Wow. Uh, tell me a bit more about your boat. The boat's a 31-foot motor sailor uh, built in Norway in 1973. Uh, her name is Magnus. We changed it from Pumpkin, as she originally was when she came to us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Didn't want to sail with Pumpkin. <laughs> Didn't want to sail with Pumpkin. Well. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite a husky boat, not a very long one, but uh, quite beamy and, and very solid and very reliable and served us extremely well. Well, and uh, your companions, Marjorie and Leo? My wife, uh, my wife Marjorie Simmons, and, uh, and our, our very old dog, uh, uh, Whippet, named, uh, named Leo. Leo was another one of these sort of preparatory items, too, because um, Marjorie was sort of saying, well, I don't know if we want to make this, you know, this is a huge long trip. Do we want to do this with an ailing and elderly dog? 
And the answer was it was really good for the dog. I mean, he didn't have to go through uh, a Nova, another two Nova Scotia winters. He, uh, he got this, his time down south. He was with us 24 hours a day, and, and uh, he did very well, yeah. although we lost him on the way back. He died on, in Virginia on the way home. Yeah, sorry to hear about that. I, I did know that. Um, how did you feel the day that you left Descous and Cape Breton and you're finally off on this journey after planning for so long? Exhausted. <laughs> we, uh, we had, we'd been working so hard, and uh, I think it's true with almost every cruise, certainly every cruise I've, I, I can remember, uh, a big one, you were working so hard to get the thing ready, and you've been trying to rem not forget anything, and you know, flashlight batteries, and toothpaste, and who knows what all Yeah, else. you're really self-contained once you're away from land. You really are. So we just, w by the time we got away, it was actually the end of the day, and we just went for one hour, and, and got out of this goose across Lennox Passage into a little cove, dropped the anchor, and slept for 12 hours. Now, I, I was reading your columns in the Halifax Herald while you were on this journey, and that, that was all very interesting, but it seemed like you had a heck of a lot of problems along the way. Did it seem that way to you, or is that uh, just what you were writing about? Well, it, it's, it's a, uh, yes, I think that's true. I mean, sometimes I say to people when they make remarks like that, yeah, but tell me about an eight-month stretch in which you didn't have a heck of a lot of problems yeah. no matter what you were doing, you know. Um, so this, it's partly just a function of the amount of time. Um, but also, it's the novelty of the whole thing. I mean, you're going into a new port every night. You're going through a new passage of water every day. You're going into a new situ always a new situation, and you're always kind of dope out what it is. And, you know, you, on the way home, it was infinitely easier. Um, my guest today is Silver Donald Cameron. We're going to take a short break and be back right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. Welcome back. My guest today is Silver Donald Cameron. We're talking about his book and his journey sailing away from winter. Um, how far would you sail in a single day as you're going down the east coast of North America? Well, uh, it, we sailed about 30 miles, maybe 40, uh, once or twice uh, over 50. Uh, and, but that was primarily because of the dog. We, we used to, s we, he never did learn to do his stuff on the boat. So <laughs> you basically had to take him ashore in the morning, sail all day, and then take him ashore in the evening. And uh, so, we, you know, we say other people sail dog leg courses, we sail yes. dog bladder courses. Oh, okay. Um, so that was our sort of limitation. On the way back, um, I, I took a couple of, uh, of other guys. Marjorie didn't come for the last legs of the trip. She came as far as Virginia, but on the, from Virginia on north, um, these other guys and I went three days at a crack, and we just uh, we did it in several long, long hops and uh, got, got, made lots of miles. Well, but before. of course it's not. You were, you were in no big hurry to get where you were going. The, the journey was the goal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were going through all these wonderful places down the east coast of the United States. All the, the historic cities of the states are, really are there, you know, and, you know, New York and Baltimore and Washington. We didn't go to Washington, but, um, but Charleston, Savannah, <coughs> and, you know, we weren't going to rush through it. We were, uh, you know, happy to go 30 miles a day, 40 miles a day, take our time and see it. Sure. Now, tell me a bit about uh, New York Harbor. That does not sound like a great place where I'd want to be on a sailboat anywhere around there, but you, you went... Right into the heart of the city there, didn't you? Right through it, right down the East River. Well, the, the East River is a, is a funny river because it's a river with two mouths and no headwaters. It, it has a mouth opening into Long Island Sound and a mouth opening into New York Bay. And, uh, and that's the route from Long Island Sound into, uh, down to the outer harbor of New York. And it's, uh, to get into it, you go through an area called Hell Gate. And Hell Gate is a place where the currents are just ferocious, just savage. And, uh, so you have to time your passage so that the current is with you as you, as you go through, and you're not fighting these steep standing waves and so on. Yeah. Well, it was a sleigh ride. I mean, it was incredible. We went in there, and I think we were doing 10 and a half knots. The boat only does six, but we were doing 10 and a half knots over the ground, and we were whisking past all, this, all the people running on the sidewalks and their jogging outfits and so forth. <laughs> we were passing them all as we went through. Finally got shot under 13 bridges and spat out uh, right by the Statue of Liberty. Were you scared? Um, I certainly was uh, paying attention. <laughs> Marjorie would say, gee, look at this, and I'd say, take a picture, honey, I'm steering the book. Yeah. You know? And it was after that, you were off the coast of the state of New Jersey, and uh, that seemed to be a particularly rough patch for you. Jersey coast is a rough patch. It's a long, uh, I know it's your home state, but, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, but it's a long, slow bottom. It, it, goes, it stays shallow quite a long way out, and so it can be quite rough. 
and there aren't many places to go in. There's uh, the ports are, are uh, narrow little entrances and so on. And um, yeah, we did have a, 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 at that point I left Marjorie and the dog behind and because there was a hundred mile passage from New York City more or less to Cape May that I was going to make with a friend. And uh, yeah, we got ourselves into some weather and, and uh, you know, for 27 hours or something making the trip and we're plenty tired when we got there. You had to stay awake through the night. Oh yeah, to, uh, <laughs> yeah somebody did. You that's know. right, that's got to be a tough one. Do you ever, ever think of those other Nova Scotian sailors on your voyage, you know, like Joshua Slocum in particular? Oh sure, I mean Slocum's been one of my heroes for a long, long time and in fact he was lost uh, heading south on, from Martha's Vineyard yeah, uh, that's right. in 1907, sailed south on more or less offshore but in the same route we were going and it was never heard from again. Well, go across Delaware Bay and connect up with the Inland Waterway, maybe you could explain exactly what that is. The Inland Waterway? Um, well, the, it's, uh, it's the, inter the Intercoastal Waterway is, is basically an interconnected series of bays and sounds and rivers and harbors and estuaries and so forth. The, the whole east coast of the United States is some of the flattest land in the world. And, and the sea sort of pushes into it in all these sort of sinuous you know, backwaters and waterways. Well, over the years, the U.S. government has connected these things up. So it's possible to go in uh, behind the coast at Norfolk, Virginia, and, and not to come out, I guess, uh, until somewhere in Texas, but certainly you can go a thousand miles to Miami and never go into any significant open water, nothing bigger than, say, Halifax Harbor would be or right. something like that. Now, can you actually sail through there, or are you using your engines? It's mostly a motor strip, you know, yeah. yeah. You may sail, there's spots where you can sail a bit and, and so forth. And right, uh, as it opens up. Uh, there was a Quebec boat we followed one time that uh, the guy was absolutely de determined to sail, and he had a roller furling head sail. And uh, so it was more or less of a downwind run, and you could see him over these salt marshes. Here's all the grass growing, and here's this mast, and the sail would furl out for a moment when he was on a favorable direction, and then furl back in again and furl out again. It was quite an odd thing to see. It was like seeing a mast coming and going in the middle of a wheat field. I guess if you had a straight north wind for days at a time, that would blow you south for a bit. Yeah, but, but the so trip isn't so, you see, the trip's sinuous. Yeah, the trip that's around. Yeah. Wow. Um, how did Americans treat you when you pulled up to the wharf for supplies at night or to take Leo ashore? They were just wonderful. Uh, we had the most terrific hospitality from you know, one end of the United States to the other, and no, you know, nothing other than, than kindness and generosity, and, uh, and good fun. I mean, lots and lots of, of really delightful and enjoyable people. Okay, uh, we're going to take a short break, and my guest today is Silver Donald Cameron. We'll be back right after this. This program is presented as a public service by Mount St. Vincent University. And welcome back to the voyage here. We are sailing down the east coast of North America with Silver Donald Cameron. Uh, the year was 2004. 2004, 2005. Yeah. I'm wondering sort of what your take was on the political climate of the United States at that particular time since, you know, you have this opportunity to stop and talk to folks on, you know, along the shores. Well, it was certainly a bitterly divided country and, and the division line uh, actually fell right at the, uh, the border between Maryland and Virginia. Every state north of that voted for Kerry, every state south of that voted for Bush, and we spent election night on that line. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had been seeing all the bumper stickers that said things like save America, you know, defeat Bush, um, uh, wanted a florist to send two Bushes to Iraq, uh, you know, all these kinds, of, these kinds of things. And it didn't really, it didn't come up very much in, in uh, I mean, we weren't going to push it, we were guests, we're not going to, but, but every now and again something would happen, like in Annapolis, Maryland, I went ashore and, and uh, got into conversation with a woman and she said, what boat are you from? And I said, I'm with that little blue catch over there. And she said, are you a Canadian? And I said, yes. And she said, I am so ashamed of what our country is doing in the world. And he's quite passionate about this. I'm just, this, this government does not represent the people we are. I want to apologize for what we're doing. And you know, you're a bit taken aback. And, you know, and, and uh, I said, listen, it's not your fault. And she was terribly relieved. She said, I'm very glad you said that. You're right. It is absolutely not my fault. But that kind of thing was quite, quite rare and still quite touching. I mean, she found the first person she could say what she wanted to say to and had it out. Sure, I've, I've certainly heard that myself, Americans apologizing for their country. And um, what about the whole business of being a Canadian? Do you, do you find any particular prejudice against you for being a Canadian? Uh, 
no. Uh, once or twice, that you'd, you'd get an odd remark about the fact that we had not joined the, the United States and Iraq and so on. Um, and uh, what we did run across, particularly uh, on the way back, it seemed, was, was we ran across the trail of some rather ill-behaved Canadians who had been quite boorish and obnoxious in their comments about the, the country in which they were guests and would do things like not fly a courtesy U.S. flag at the cross trees and that sort of thing, which seems to me quite unconscionable. Now, you went all the way to Florida, um, and then you, you head over to Bahamas. Uh, any particular adventures off the coast of Florida or, or in the waterway there that you like to provide us with? Well, I guess partly it's just the thrill of going across there. I mean, you, you, uh, we left from Fort Lauderdale at 2 o'clock in the morning or thereabouts and you sorted our way out through the harbor and then offshore. And quite a stiff westerly breeze sort of blowing us along and uh, two other boats going in company with us. And uh, when the day came, daybreak came up, here we were in this indigo water. I'd never seen water colored like that before. It was absolutely gorgeous. And by early afternoon, we're, we're in the Bahamas. And now we're in aqua-colored water. It's only 12 feet deep. There's white sand underneath it. And, and uh, you know, here's this big guy on the dock saying, welcome to the Bahamas, man. And uh, you know, you just sort of think, wow, we actually have done this. We've uh, come all this way, and we've actually reached the Bahamas. And that was, I mean, that was like paradise. That's a, the Bahamas are absolutely wonderful. How long is that sail from, um, from Florida? Where did you leave from about Fort Lauderdale? Left from Fort Lauderdale. To which island? Uh, Grand Bahama. Oh, yeah. I went to, to West End on Grand Bahama. Yeah. And how long did that take? It was just a day. It was, uh, you can it do was that about in a day? eight hours, nine hours, something like that. Uh, yeah. Do you feel the huge cultural difference, the leap from oh, yeah. Florida to there? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So did you find your tropical paradise? Well, I had always thought, right from the start, I'd read about the Bahamas a lot, and, and, uh, and I'd always thought that the town of Hopetown sounded particularly interesting. And, uh, you know, we so we finally got there, and, and Hopetown was, was just as, as wonderful as I'd hoped it would be. It's only two streets deep, it's on a little narrow island, and, and the inside of it uh, faces into a very tight little harbor, very sheltered little harbor, and the outside of it faces the open Atlantic, and uh, the coast, uh, the water runs out to Africa. You know. Glorious sand beach on the on the outside, a cozy little spot on the inside. It was just just terrific. And I I met uh, another cruiser from Canada at the dock at one point, and he leaned forward and he said, "You know, I could live here." And I said, "You know, I think I could too." <laughs> and uh, I still feel that way. I guess it's it's radically different the traveling the way that you are, um, you know, sailing down the coast as opposed to taking the airplane and renting the car and staying in the hotel and all of those other things. I mean, how, how did the two compare? Um, I mean, one is kind of an adventure, but there's, there's so much hardship and day-to-day -day work that goes into it, and the other one is so easy. Well, it's not hardship. Uh, I mean, if you enjoy this kind of thing, if, yeah. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have missed it. And I've subsequently been back to the Bahamas by air, and, and you're right, it wasn't the same thing at all. It was, a, you know, a very different mis business. It used to be the case that you would come into a little port in Nova Scotia, for example, uh, with a little Nova Scotian schooner, which is what I started with, and people would come down to the dock to welcome you, and you were instantly part of the village. You're kind of a Freemasonry of the waterfront that you immediately belonged to, and everybody could remember when their fathers and grandfathers had boats more or less like yours. And uh, that's gone a little bit, but it's still more or less the case that, you know, when you arrive, you, you become, you, you, there's a place where you can kind of link into the community at the, at the dock or at the marina or the mooring field. And then for a temporary period, you are part of that, uh, that community in this uh, kind of eccentric way that mariners are, you know. You're also part of a floating community because there's a whole migration going down the coast at the same time. Uh, a lot of people getting away from winter at, the, at yeah. the same point. So you keep meeting people, you know, you meet somebody in New Jersey and then you see them again in North Carolina and then you see them again in the Bahamas, you know. Oh, it's good to know that camaraderie is still there. Um, personal question here, did this test your relationship between you and Marjorie? Um, sure, but no more than, than any eight-month period, I think, would have, uh, <laughs> would have done. You know, there are ups and downs in any marriage in any, over a period of time. I think it was, in a sense, almost more of a test at the beginning, you know, because I really wanted to go and she was quite unsure. Once we, we got going, she had been very apprehensive about the States. She thought this is a very violent, I mean, she, you know, you, you watch television, you really get a, a, an impression of the United States as being a kind of a jungle. And so she was quite apprehensive about it. And as we went along and found that it wasn't like that at all, that people were treating us so uh, wonderfully, she became more and more relaxed. And I think both of us would say it was an experience we wouldn't have missed one of the high points of our lives. Excellent. Well, we're going to take another short break and be back with Silver Donald Cameron right after this.
If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us. We welcome your comments. And welcome back. Um, I guess this Silver Donald Cameron. We've been talking about his voyage down the east coast of North America. What does a writer come away with after this journey? I mean, how does it make you feel about yourself and the way that you fit into the world? I guess I feel pretty privileged. I mean, I, one of the things that, that I got out of it is, is, in a sense, if I since I had to, I had, had a book contract, I was writing columns for the Herald and so on, so I had to kind of digest it and make sense of it and reflect on, on the whole process as it, as it was going on, even though I was very busy doing it at the same time. So, but there had to be a pause and then a column to be written or, or whatever and notes to be done. Um, and I know that many of the other cruisers um, were sort of whisking through it, they were, and, and, and I, I have a sense that for them it became much more of a blur than it did for me, that, that for me I was you know, really looking at very specific parts of it and kind of trying to capture them. So I, I guess in a sense my internal photo album in my, uh, is, uh, is stronger and richer than I think it would have been had I not been writing about it. That's right, I think just the act of writing, your job was to record what was going on day to day and reflect what was happening around you. It makes you observe more, think more, and make all of those interesting kind of connections, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I, I felt very privileged, and I felt very privileged to have the opportunity to explore another country like that. And you know, the United States, we think we know a lot about it. We actually don't know nearly as much about it as, as we think we do. And when you immerse yourself in it, and not only in, not in just one place, but go moving along and seeing one place, and here's the South, here's the North, here's New England, here's, you know, Florida and so on, um, you realize what a huge, diverse, and interesting country it is. Don, what was the favorite part of your voyage? And I guess the three favorite parts, as far as sailing were concerned, were the coast of Nova Scotia, Chesapeake Bay, and the, and, and the Abacos in the Bahamas. Um, I guess probably I would choose the Abacos, and part of the reason is that, aside from the fact that they're just a glorious, beautiful, wonderful place, uh, is the fact that we weren't traveling anymore at that point. Well, once you're back home, um, your boat's tied up at the dock and you're, you're sitting down in your house in Discoose. I mean, what are you thinking about? Well, on a day like this, which is a bitterly cold day in Halifax in January, I find myself thinking that, uh, um, what would it be, three years ago today, I would have just reached the Bahamas. I might be in for that first day of sailing in the Bahamas, which was glorious. And it was a long day of just crossing the banks to get to a, an uninhabited desert island. I mean, it, it was a, you know, a glorious day of sailing and, and this wonderful sense of having got there. And it was the middle of January, and we were sailing. <laughs> you know? Any other adventures, sailing adventures coming up? Nothing planned, but you never know what's going to happen. You know, we, we've sold that boat. Magnus is, uh, in, is now, has been sold to the man who built her in 1973. But we still have Silver Sark, the boat we started with, and we'll be launching her this summer. So we'll see. You'll be back on the water. Don, thanks for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. I'll see you again next time. <laughs>